All right, sorry about that interruption. Um, what we have here is we have uh, to find that cut score for the 90th percentile, we would take our total, 30, or the number of items we have our count, 30, multiply it by a percent, 90, and this tells me the 27th score from the bottom would give me my uh, cut score for the 90th percentile. So that's 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. So this would be 96% would put you in the 90th percentile of the class. So I'm here to give you this in, this this uh, this example because the percent is not the same thing as the percentile. Percentile ranks you in the class, where the percent in this case would be just your grade in the class. Now there are other important percentiles. There are deciles, which go by uh, tens, and the quartiles, which goes by quarters. And this right here is our most important one because our Q0, or our first quarter, is our minimum. Our Q1 is technically the first quartile. And you're going to see why this is important in just a moment. Our Q2, we don't usually call it Q2. Our Q2 is the median. Our Q3, which is our 75 percentile, or third quartile. And then our Q4 is our maximum. That's the 100th percentile, our max. And some of you may remember that minimum, Q1, median, Q3, and maximum gets you to the five number summary or the box and whisker plot. Now, the box and whisker plot is used to show variation in data that isn't necessarily symmetric. It could be symmetric, but it doesn't have to be. Now, what I have is I have some hypothetical entrance exams for three of my classes. And what I'm going to do is show you how to find the five number summary, or the minimum, Q1, Q3, maximum, and median. Now the first thing to do is we're going to look at our max and min. And since we're trying to figure out how varied the data is, we'll put our max and min on the number line 5 and 20. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to find the median first. The median is in the middle of the data. Whoops, I just made my first mistake. Sorry about that. My median is going to be um, between the, not between the 9 and the 11. Our median is going to be right on the 11. That's my middle number. And my middle number is, you know, if you move your fingers into the middle, here we are. Now that's going to be our median, and we'll put a line there for the middle of our box and whisker plot. Now, since this is our median, we move our finger off of the median, and then we try to find the middle of the top data for our Q3. So we split our top data, those four pieces, in half, and this gives me the number between 15 and 18, which is 16.5. And there's our Q3. Then we do the same thing. Since this is our median, we put our finger on the 5 and the 9 and go to the middle. The number between 6 and 8 is 7. And there we have our box and whisker plot. Now, you'll see that this box and whisker plot has a lot of variation. The middle 50% of the data between the 25 percentile and the 75 percentile is pretty spread out. So this is a very wide distribution for the inner quartile range, IQR, of this middle part. We'll talk more about IQR later. All right, it's time to do class number two. Now, to go to the middle, you can just bring your fingers to the middle and see if it's balanced. And this is also uh, pretty easy to find since you have six numbers on either side. And these six data points on either side give you a median of 10.5. It would also help if I had followed my own instructions and put my minimum and maximum where the data points were. Take the minimum and maximum from the data. Now, you'll notice that the median is not actually on a data point, so we're going to put a finger here and a finger here. You count the 10 and the 1 and go to the middle, which is going to be between 5 and 8, which is 6.5. And then we're going to go from 11 to 19, go to the middle, which is 14.5. Now you'll see that this box and whisker plot has very, very long whiskers and um, a smaller 
box. And that box, which goes from 25% to 75% of the class, has a much smaller distribution. So the middle 50% of the class has a smaller IQR, or smaller 50%, than the class above it. And now finally we're going to go to class number three. Now you can pause the video here, try this yourself, and then when you unpause it you'll see the answer. Okay, the first dot is three, the last dot is ten. That's a minimum and maximum. We're now going to go to the middle. Go to the middle, it's between the five and the six, and since uh, the number between five and six is 5.5, .5. now since this did not land on a number, we count from the five to the three, and our middle number is four, right there. And since this did not land on a number, we go from the 6 to the 10. Our middle number is 7. All right. Everything looks good. All right. That right there is our last box and whisker plot. Now, you'll notice that that middle 50% of the class is very small compared to the other two. And also, you'll notice the max and min are also pretty close to it, too. So, class number 3 had a lot... Of a very small distribution, very little variation, where class 1 had the widest IQR and class 2 had a smaller IQR, or at middle 50%, but wider max and min. So, here's a little thinking problem for you. Read these questions and try to think what you think the answer would be. On the previous question, which class is probably the hardest to teach and why? How about the easiest to teach, and why? The easier one to answer is the bottom one. On the previous page, which class is probably the easiest to teach, and why? Now, if you're focused on 20 being a good score, and 1 being a bad score, that's the, that's the wrong way to look at it. Even though class number 3 had low scores, since their variability was small, they were a very tight group in terms of being close together. This would be the easiest class to teach. And then it becomes a debate on whether you would think that these were the hardest ones to teach. If you have a class that has a wide variation, wide distribution of numbers, and they're not very clustered, they're very spread out, as you see by the wide box pot plots on these, you would have a hard time probably teaching these because of the different learning levels if the test was an accurate entrance exam. So, I don't know. If you're, if you're focused on the middle, this class would be harder because the middle group is, is wider. But if you're focused on the middle, this class would be easier. And then your outliers or your, your higher and lower bounds, whether they're outliers or not, would be, would be tough to teach. So thus is so one of the problems that we deal with in education is do we shoot for the middle, do we shoot for here, do we shoot for here? Because even though we have high standards, we have to present those high standards at a level where we can all achieve at that. So there's a, there's a little rant. Now I want to show you symmetric skewed left and skewed right pictures of box and whisker plots. A symmetric box and whisker plot wouldn't necessarily be big nor small. It just would have this essential... Um, it would be you know, pretty balanced. Skewed left is when you'd have the median a little bit lower on the box and whiskers pulling that in a low direction. You could have this also on the right hand side as well. This might be a little bit more skewed left if you um, took a look at it on a histogram this way. It's probably a better picture. And then skewed right is going to be you know, quite the opposite well, a reflection of it, basically, to skew it to the right. And uh, the best way to see these skewed left and skewed right and skewed and symmetric graphs is to make histograms all of your box and whisker plots. The final thing we're going to do is do an outlier check. Now, an outlier check is looking back at my uh, hypothetical 101 data. And I want to ask, was 63% an actual outlier? When reporting statistics, I want to know the statistical outliers because... I don't want them to kind of skew my data, or I don't want to include them in my data if I'm trying to present and make myself look good. So the question becomes, if I have these 20 scores, notice I've dropped off the 10 scores who um, uh, didn't pass the class, I'm wondering if I should drop off the 63 as well and just include those from 74 to my 101. Well, here are the five steps as illustrated in the book on how to find an outlier and to make sure that the outlier is an actual piece. 
Now, one thing I've done is I did put my data in order, so you're lucky there. The data is in order, but you need to find from the data the Q1 and the Q3. We're going to measure from the Q1 and the Q3 our um, outliers. Now, I'm going to show you that you know if we go to the middle here, the middle is between these two 90s. There's 10 pieces of data to the right, 10 pieces of data to the left. Then we go five pieces of data down. There's our Q1 at 84, 5. And if we go to our Q3, which is between 96 and 96, our Q3 is 96. Step two is to find the IQR. And I've been mentioning IQR a lot in this video, but IQR stands for inner quartile range. So it's Q3 minus Q1. That's the definition of inner quartile range. So we go from 95 minus 84.5, we get an answer of 10.5. There's our IQR, 10.5. So what this means is that the distance between the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile is 10.5 in this data range, or 10, there's basically a full letter, a little bit more than a full letter difference between the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile. Okay, step three. Now, of course, one more thing. I'm looking at only this data and not my 10 failed students who got below a 63. So of these 20 students, this is the IQR of those 20 that are left. Now, step three is you take your IQR and multiply it by 1.5. This gives me my outlier bound. So I'm going to take my 10.5, multiply it by 1.5, and get an answer of 15.75. Now, that is my outlier bound, and the only thing I can kind of tell you that this is a little analogous to is maybe maybe like a bound for a standard deviation. But see, what you'll do in step four is you take your Q1 and subtract your 15.75. And this is going to make my lower outlier bound. And that gives me 84.5 minus 15.75 equals 68.75. So my lower outlier bound is 68.75. Anything below that's an outlier. Now, I'm also for step four going to take my Q3 and add 15.75. And this is going to be my upper outlier bound. So that's going to be 95 plus 15.75 is equal to 110.75. That's my upper outlier bound. Any student above 110% or actually 111% if you used whole numbers, would be an outlier. So step five, check below 68.75 and check above 110.75. So my finding is that since I had someone below 68.75, 63% is a statistical outlier. And I can throw it out if I deem it so, because I will, you know, have the data that says, look, it is an outlier. By the way, I do understand that you can kind of argue with this data that if I had the other 10 scores in this list of 20, then that may not be the outlier. Maybe one of those other 10 scores would be an outlier, especially if they're all zeros or all below 50% to a great degree. But according to all the students who passed my class, this is theoretical data, or hypothetical data, of course. If all of these students passed my class, this student was an outlier. All right, so with that in mind, there's my statistical class for you. And uh, if you have questions, um, thanks for watching the second part of this video. And I will uh, email you back. Thank you very much.